Hi, I'm Rick Hofling. At United Airlines, we believe that all citizens need to be informed about the important issues that affect their lives and their communities. That's why we're proud to support the Make a Difference programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by United Airlines, Investors Bank, Holy Name Medical Center in Teaneck, New Jersey. Healing begins here. Health Republic Insurance of New Jersey. Fedway Associates, Partners for Health Foundation, partnering to make our communities healthier, better places to live. And by ADP, a comprehensive provider of human resources technology and services. Promotional support provided by The Record, North Jersey's trusted source, and NorthJersey.com. And by New Jersey Monthly, the magazine of the Garden State, available at newsstands. This is one-on-one. -on -one. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You got that? this? Here it is, man. Look at that. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> when you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Hi, Steve Adubato here at the Tisch WNET studio in the heart of Lincoln Center. You can see uh, behind me, it's a little dreary. It's rainy. But uh, out in Long Island, where you are, uh, Mr. Joe Waiulo, who is the curator and co-founder of the Long Island Aquarium and Exhibition Center. Center. Things are great out there, right? It's great year-round. We only close on Thanksgiving and Christmas. So, yeah, any time of year is great to come out. And you started this 16 years ago. I did, initially, uh, actually 23 years ago, in oh, starting really? the plans and proposals for the aquarium. And the aquarium now celebrated its 15th year actually being open. That is fabulous. So the idea for it, you're out on the island. Yeah. And you say what? Well, I grew up on Long Island. And uh, I was always into fish and you know, fishing with my dad and my grandfather and followed a career in marine biology through school. Uh, ended up with a job at New York Aquarium in Coney Island. Realized that's something that I really enjoyed doing. Uh, but wasn't crazy about commuting into Brooklyn every day. And we live on an island. It seems kind of silly not to have an aquarium. Uh, so I met one great guy, Jim Bissett, and uh, we sat down and eight years worth of plans and proposals. And uh, we, we built a great team and have a fantastic public aquarium now. But you told me right before we got on the air, I asked you about the coral reef display. Yes. And you said it's taken years put together. What do, you, what do you mean? Yeah, well, when I first started uh, taking care of corals, there really wasn't much known as far as maintaining them, keeping them long term in an in a enclosed environment. That's some, some old video of my tank there. Um, but uh, so through the years of figuring out how they, what they need to survive and prosper. Uh, so it's been about a 30 year run for me. And the tank out there is a 20,000 gallon. It's one of the largest in the world. And it's uh, internationally known. Why is it important to understand coral? Uh, corals do provide uh, a lot of uh, good importance for um, people in, uh, especially in poorer areas. Uh, they provide the security for the fish to grow and prosper. Uh, they provide a lot of the vacation places that yeah. we like to go to. Yeah. Our, those islands are built by corals, so protecting them protects a lot of our interests as well. Yeah, let's show some video, because some of the other great exhibits out at the uh, Long Island Aquarium and, and Exhibit Center uh, ex exhibition center. Um, shark dive. Talk about the shark dive. Shark dive. We have a 120,000 gallon shark tank filled with sharks and you can go down with our dive instructors. We have uh, great dive instructors out there, Maggie and Rachel, and uh, they take you down. You don't have to be certified, uh, but at full face mask, you can talk to each other while you're diving. Wait, hold on. The whole interactive piece. Explain that to me. Uh, yeah, we're very interactive at the aquarium. We're very hands on. So we actually, you know, you can look through the glass at these sharks and it's still very impressive, but immersed in their environment, totally different ball game. And this gives you the opportunity to go down, hang out with the sharks for 20 minutes. You can talk to each other underwater. A explain the safety factor. 100% safety. You're inside this cage that the sharks cannot get into. And, uh, but you're immersed in there and the sharks are literally coming within inches of you as, the, as they cruise by. The other exhibit I know you're really proud of is the sea lion encounter. Excuse me, the, uh, the sea lion, what is it? Uh, well, we have a sea lion stadium, so we do different shows there throughout the, throughout the day. 
Uh, there's a photo opportunity with them. You can get a nice kiss from some of the sea lions well, yeah, as well. What, what, what do you mean you can get a kiss from a sea lion? Yeah, uh, after the initial, sh after the shows are done, uh, after the shows, you can. Uh, <laughs> I'm looking yeah, at it right there. there. You go. There's one of our weddings, so we do a lot of catering <laughs> Wait, at the aquarium. You do weddings. Weddings, bar mitzvahs, you name it. We cater, uh, have an incredible catering department at the aquarium. We've got the hotel that we've just built, the Hyatt Place East End, right next door. So it's really a destination. But, but Joe, what I'm curious about is what happens if the sea lion doesn't want to kiss one of these people? Correct. You can't make them do something that they don't want to do. Do they ever say no? Uh, yeah, they have, uh, they have their moods just like us. <laughs> <laughs> and they just um, say no. They'll, yeah, they just, and, you know, and you have to respect that, and um, yeah. you have to move on. Uh, talk to us about the penguin exhibit. Penguin exhibit is great. Uh, it's 10 years now. Uh, we've had seven babies born there, and we do a penguin encounter program. Oh. Here's one of the encounters here. And uh, you get to go into the exhibit with, with us. Right in there. Yeah, yeah. And then we have an encounter room uh, where they, you can go down and actually uh, see what a penguin feels like. You get to touch a penguin and really learn about their biology and how fascinating those creatures are. What's it like for you? I mean, it, it took all those years. You started in your basement, right? Yeah, yeah. It took all those years to create this. Mm -hmm. And then you see people coming to, out onto the island, to Long Island. They come to the aquarium and exhibition center, and you see them enjoying themselves, interacting. Mm -hmm. What's it like for you? It's a huge honor. It's, um, you know, people are spending their money to come see something that, that we built. Um, it's a great way of educating the public for uh, environmental protection. Um, but, you know, people also want to be entertained as well. So, yeah, when I'm in there or I'm working and I hear the kids screaming when they see that shark tank, the oohs and the ahs, and uh, it's incredibly rewarding for me to be yeah. in that situation. And so everybody knows, it's in Riverhead, Long Island? Riverhead, Long Island. So just take the LIE out to, like, exit 73, and we're right, at, we're right there in Riverhead. You're proud of what you've done? Uh, very much so. My son's helped me build it, and uh, it's just been a, a great, great project. I'm truly honored to be part of it. And before I let you go, it's a destination area. Describe what else is going on out there. Oh, yes. <clears throat> well, we've got the Hyatt Place to East End right next door, a hotel that we built. We've got uh, Atlantis Banquets and Events, so it's a, a huge catering hall next to the aquarium. We do the catering at the aquarium. Wineries uh, are too? Wineries are great. Uh, farmlands, beautiful farmlands. People think of New York and they just think of where we are right now in New York City. Out east, there's tremendous farmlands, Tanger Outlets, uh, Splish Splash Water Park. You know, you can really go out and spend uh, a short little staycation and in, really enjoy the East End. It's, it's worlds away from where we are sitting here. Long Island's a special place. Very special. I'm really glad to have uh, been born and raised there. Well, great to have you here in Manhattan and uh, wish you nothing but the best out there. Great, Keep Steve. doing Thank great things. Thank you very much. I appreciate um, it. Joe is the curator and co-founder of the Long Island Aquarium and Exhibition Center. And uh, 16 years, 15 or 16? Coming on 16 now. Coming 16 yep. years. One million visitors every year and uh, over at uh, Riverhead, Long Island. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate it. Thank you. Stay with us. Uh, it's raining here in Manhattan, but uh, good things also happening <laughs> out on Long Island. We'll be right back right after this. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We're pleased to welcome Tom Viola, Executive Director, Broadway Cares, Equity, Fights AIDS. Good to have you, Tom. You too, Steve. Good to see you. Um, two organizations merged into yes, one one. Uh, two small grassroots organizations that were founded in 1988. Equity Fights AIDS came out of Actors' Equity Association, the union for actors and stage managers. Broadway Cares sort of came about in the, in the Broadway community. We worked side by side, very small, um, in those first couple years and merged in 92 um, to become Broadway Cares slash Equity Fights AIDS. In an effort to do what? Well, you know what, in an effort to come together to really respond uh, to the HIV AIDS crisis, to raise money so that we could respond both through the, what's called the Actors Fund, which is the employee assistance program of the entertainment industry, um, and also to award grants now to over 450 AIDS and family service organizations across the country. 250 million, million dollars. dollars. Yeah. It's extraordinary. And, and literally, what's, what's particularly terrific about that is beginning in 1996, our mission actually even began to expand. 
When we began doing this with the Actors Fund, funding them in 88, we were funding just the HIV AIDS initiative. That began sh to shift in 96, uh, where we took on the Phyllis Newman Women's Health Initiative. We also fund the Al Hirschfeld Free Clinic, um, their addiction recovery services, health insurance issues. Last year, we awarded the Actors Fund $5.2 million, mm -hmm. which allowed them to assist over 17,000 folks in the entertainment industry. And that's not just actors. That's any, everybody in the business, whether you're on stage, behind the stage, front of house, producer's office, in the television or movie industry. There's a safety net of social services that our work in the theater community, our fundraising work, allows them to provide. So I understand this, though, Tom, but you don't give money directly to we're, individuals? No, we're not, we're not a social service agency ourselves. Well, for instance, the other half of our mission, uh, last year we awarded about $6.2 million to these 450 social service agencies across the country. And they deal directly And they with do the direct work. They're on the ground doing what I would say is the hardest work. It's the food banks, the health clinics, housing programs, case management, harm reduction programs. And there are groups large and small. I mean, here in New York City, they're as big as God's Love We Deliver and GMHC mm -hmm. and Housing Works to literally Literally, food banks in the back of churches, like at St. Luke's and St. Clement's and St. Paul the Apostle, right here in this neighborhood. But you know, it's, you're not just in New York City. We're not. We're not. Our, our grant making is literally, we're, we, grant, we award to, uh, organizations in all 50 states. Um, which we're very proud of. We've actually searched out organizations like in Idaho and Wyoming and North Dakota. That? Well, you know, um, here in the city, it's one experience to live with HIV AIDS or any debilitating illness. There are a lot of, there's a lot of access to resources. You have to know how to get to them, but there are, there are a variety of options. When you begin to get outside of the major metropolitan areas, mm. particularly living with HIV, um, you, your, your options are, are particularly limited. And you think I, it's different? It's, say what? You think it's different? I think it's definitely different, and particularly when you have to address the stigma that folks have even to access those services. Today? Today. Today. And you know Thir what? Hold on. 30 years later. 30 years later. You still feel there's yes. a significant stigma? Absolutely. Around HIV Absolutely. And it depends where you are. I mean, and I think it's a different kind of stigma than we were facing when this began Describe 30, it. 35 years ago. Well, you know, I think it was more outright. It was almost easier, I would say, to stand up against it and battle it. I think now it's a little more insidious. Um, it's quiet. It even sometimes comes from the gay community itself, a feeling that people don't necessarily want to know their HIV status because they feel if that's shared, they will be ostracized. And the fact of the matter is, the best way that we prevent HIV is through knowing your status. There are about 50,000 people every year that um, are infected by HIV. Uh, there have been literally over 600,000 deaths. There's, uh, there have been 13,000 deaths this, just this year alone. Um, while the medications exist, which allow people to live with, this, with, with, right. the, with, the, uh, with the virus, um, if you're not adequately fed, if you don't have good nutrition, if your life is in chaos for one reason or another, you can't adhere to those medications to make sure that not only is your own health taken care of, but that you're not transmitting the virus. Because if you're on the medication and your viral load goes to zero, your T cells go up, you literally, you're living with the virus, but you are not infectious. If people are afraid to know. Explain that. Well, what that means is, if your viral load goes down to zero, that means you, you have no, you don't have the, the, um, the infection in your bloodstream, you can't, you, you can't transmit the virus. You still live with the, with the antibodies that, that um, keep it in your system, but you can't share it. If you don't know what your status is and you're not on medication, you could well appear healthy, but be infectious. So what we tell people constantly is to know your status. Know your status. You know, I, I was torn as to whether I wanted to bring this up. Sure, I know what you're gonna say. What am I gonna say? I think you're gonna ask me about Charlie Sheen. Yeah, you see, we're taping this program. Uh, it's, about, it's, it's funny, it's literally right before Thanksgiving. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's very warm, warmer than normal yeah. uh, here in New York City. And this whole Charlie Sheen thing broke. And it's not important what I think about what he did or didn't do, said or didn't say. My question to you is, as someone who's been on the front lines and has sure. fought and has taught and has raised money and sure. helped so many people, my question is, what is there for us to learn from what well, we think we know about this? Here's my feeling about that. I'm hoping that um, what Charlie has shared with us is an opportunity for discussion and education. 
as opposed to something to be shamed or sensationalized. Um, you know, when, sh when there is a conversation about HIV, when there's a conversation about testing and the medications, it allows us to actually take care of each other and ourselves in a way that tamps down how the virus is spread. When you, when, if people are listening to what Charlie has to say and figure it is just an item of gossip, it becomes question about, questions about what they view his choices, may have, his personal choices may have Does been. Does it matter? You know what? It, Did you, do, I think my, it do you think it doesn't matter? I think it matters for Charlie, certainly, and it matters for the, for the folks that he comes in contact with, with and loves. But I'm hoping that for, like it has been for many folks, that this diagnosis is a wake-up call is a wake-up call and allows him, you know, Charlie's gonna have the best medical care that's, that exists. So beyond the medication, yeah. his doctor, you know, was on TV with him. He talked yeah. about just what I did in terms of the viral load and the... Can it help, going back to your cause, it's not your cause, the yeah, cause of many. Can I, it I, help the larger effort that you are involved in helping thousands, yes, hundreds think, of thousands? I think it can, because I think if people, again, aren't sensationalizing this or trying to shame him, it can actually allow people to have the discussion that, may, that sort of tamps down the stigma. Tom, do we care enough? I mean, you've raised, you and your colleagues have raised $250, $250 million over a significant number of years. But do the rest of us care enough about HIV and AIDS or have many of us come to the conclusion, hey, there's some pretty yeah. darn good medication there are. and Absolutely. it's not what it was. So, hey, given that, the other crises out there? Well, you know what, I think when we first started doing this, again, as I said, there, were, there have been over 600,000 deaths from, from AIDS since 1988. That is literally more than in any American war from the American Revolution to Iraq. So when you think that this has happened in 30 years, that's, that's cataclysmic mm -hmm. um, in all kinds of communities, not just here in the city, but in suburban and rural, rural communities all over the country. Now it's a different issue. What AIDS has become is a part of a number of issues that I think we're all facing as well, whether that is uh, about lack of resources, whether that's lack, lack of access to decent health care, uh, mental health issues, addi addiction, job loss, racism. Housing. Housing, all of it. I mean, you, it, it, it exacerbates any of, the, any of those issues. So when we reach out to those folks, we are actually often reaching out to an entire community of people. And finally, when we put up your website one more time, people sure. can give. Uh, you can. You can go to our website, probablycares.org. Um, if you're in a Broadway theater, probably right now, you're hearing an audience appeal from members of the Broadway community and national tours and off-Broadway. You can drop a bucket, uh, buck in a red bucket. And truly, that money is going to work on the ground. The percentage uh, for every... For every $100 we raise, $80 goes out to grants and program services, and $20 are administrative and fundraising costs. That's a high percentage. It's a very high percentage, and one we are very, very proud of. Tom Viola, Executive Director, Broadway Cares, Equity Fights That's AIDS. It. Been doing it for a lot of years yeah. and raising a lot of money for a great cause. Thank you so much, Thank Tom. you, Steve, very much. Appreciate it. Keep it up. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. We'll be right back from the Tisch WNET studio here in the heart of New York City. Thank you. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Don Katz, founder and CEO of Audible and founder of Nork Venture Partners. Good to see you, my friend, Don Katz. Good to see you, Steve. Wonderful. You're here with us in our New York City studio at WNET, right? Right. But your operation is out of Newark. We also talked to you last time, I think, at NGIT. Um, New, York, uh, and New Jersey Institute of Technology. Tell folks what Newark Venture Partners is all about and why it matters. Right. Well, you know, Audible moved to Newark in, in 2007 and uh, has, has really you know, just thrived being part of the city. And P.S. If those who don't yeah. know what Audible is, Audible.com is the big audiobook download service that uh, happily is a, a big global company now with 16 global centers and people all over the world. And actually came to Newark with only about 100 employees, and there'll be there's about a thousand. Now and uh, we keep growing, and I don't know if you heard, but we're uh, taking over the a big church down the street at 15 James Street, and going to rehab that whole gigantic church uh, near our campus uh, um, and turn it into a tech cathedral. So it's uh, it's a big deal. It's a lot of fun going to go stuff and being in Newark, and plus you know working at Audible kind of means you're part of a great urban comeback story, which is what the way we see things going for Newark, which is you know a, a city that's. Uh, you know, only 18 minutes from uh, Penn Station, not far mm. from where we are here, but is uh, 
is kind of not part of the conversation um, when you think of what's happening in places like Brooklyn and, uh, and even, in, even in Queens. And um, Newark Venture Partners is one of those things that shouldn't be that hard to do in that there's a huge innovation economy just in this city, an overabundance of, of uh, companies that don't have places to work, don't have accelerators to be nurtured in, which is what's happening in early stage tech. So um, fairly shortly, we're going to finish a 25,000 foot accelerator that's in the building Audible's in, which is part of the Rutgers Business School at One Wash. Um, it's going to have the fastest bandwidth literally you've ever heard of. And then we're raising a fund that is to support companies that um, that we'll invest in because basically what's come in is this isn't just Newark, it's Detroit, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's Las Vegas, it's uh, other cities, even parts of Washington. Everybody kind of realizes if you don't tether challenge urban cores to early stage tech, which is where all the growth is, then you're not going to get job creation at all levels of the economy. And uh, so I think it's a positive for the city and it's also great for the investors. Let's and the take companies. a step back. Yeah. Um, Newark Venture Partners. <clears throat> so that people can really understand what it is. It, $50 million coming from where? Investors. Investors. Right. $50 million set aside to help whom to do what? So it's to literally attract companies uh, that are at early stage, very early stage, seed stage, who then go into an accelerator run by... What is an Venture. accelerator? Mean? Accelerator is a workspace. It's very cool workspace like like Audible's headquarters. But at that, when you go there with a little company, unlike when I started Audible and I was kind of on my own, even though I had fancy venture capital, um, mentors and different kinds of helpers come and work with you, almost like an academic cycle. So you might be in there for 25 weeks, and uh, the company gets people from my company, including rocket scientists, technologists, and the best finance people, the best mm. marketing people, to come down and help you accelerate the growth of your business, accelerate the science you're developing, accelerating your entry into the market. And you basically give a little bit of your equity up to, for the privilege. And if, in fact, it's a company that we believe in, and particularly a company that might want to grow mm. like Audible did in Newark, then there's venture capital to put in. What does that um, mean, venture capital? Venture capital is basically a way of putting money in buying a piece of a company um, that allows that company to execute its business plan. It's a, it's how, do these, a, how do these companies qualify? Say somebody watches right. and says, well, I, I've got an idea. That's, that's not enough. What, no, how, do they, not, how, do they, not, they, how do they get a piece <clears throat> of this $50 million? No, That's a good question. So listen, as you may know, just about every college kid knows how to write a business plan now. That's right. Because Starting a company now is a much less costly thing for a lot of different reasons, largely Amazon's uh, cloud, cloud system. Uh, right. You can rent systems that we spent millions and millions of dollars to build. So, but basically, uh, if your plan is, uh, qualifies to get you into this class, it's almost like hundreds and hundreds of companies apply, a small number kind of make the cut because of the quality of their mm. presentation, the character of the entrepreneurs, the integrity of the business plan. Then you get to go into this acceleration phase, and then that's called a seed stage investment. And then what you want next is mm. the A round. And um, this is just classic stuff that, about how uh, returns come to investors and companies grow fast. And the fact of the matter is, if you're in the world of money, the only place where you get multiples of X, meaning you know, 10X returns or 100X returns, is when you get the companies really early. It doesn't happen on the stock market anymore. So, so it's so, a, it's a, it's a, it's an important part of the economy. The important thing, though, is that it's where all job growth is happening. So it's interesting. We're here in Lincoln Center, and the Lincoln Center of today is clearly not the Lincoln Center of I don't know 20 years ago. Yep. Didn't look like this. Didn't have what is going on here today. This studio was not here. So much of what is going on today in Newark that you have been a leader. In and so many other colleagues of yours, not enough, are trying to build something. Describe what you think that will be. It's not Lincoln Center, but it's something special. Well, it's funny because the analogy is really interesting. So I was around here um, in those very early days. When Lincoln Center. Lincoln Center was a complete island, as is the Prudential Center, which is one of the great arenas in the country, as is NJ Pack, which is one of the great concert halls in the country because there's not a lot of vibrant street life as there is around here. But I was here in the early 80s. When it didn't it's look still, like, we're looking outside right, right now. It didn't look yeah. like this. Amsterdam Avenue right over here was a ghost town. 
in the early way 80s. over on the west side. Yeah, and it's just literally all the way up Amsterdam Avenue and Columbus Avenue too. Um, entrepreneurs came in, um, and they basically changed the the character of the streetscape through uh, through all kinds of new shops and and uh, and frankly, uh, you know, it was a, a lot of those entrepreneurs were, were gay entrepreneurs, and it's really a pattern that has turned uh, city blocks around for for two generations what of, could of Newark people. Be? Well, Newark. Uh, has to basically grow other audibles and jobs and things because basically you can do it while you want to the streetscape and you put a lot of buildings up. And economic development in the East is actually different than it is anywhere else because people still think putting a building up is how you turn a city around. It doesn't work that way. It's what's in the building. So government would move, you know, big corporations, uh, and it still happens from here to here on the taxpayer, but those companies haven't grown jobs, that nothing much happens. So basically, Newark has all kinds of building going on. The uh, NJPAC uh, is, is, a, is a really strong institution that's actually growing, as you know. Sure. Um, Rutgers uh, is now under the stewardship of an amazing uh, leader, Nancy, Nancy Cantor, Cantor right. who, who left being the president of Syracuse, quite a nice right. job to be part of this urban transformation. And a lot of people, including the mayor, including you know, our senators and other people who showed up at the Newark Venture Partners launch, right. um, are very focused on an urban comeback. For a city like Newark, but it's but, it's but it's a model, and it has to be clear that it's no different in Trenton or Camden or Rochester or New Haven. All the cities around the New York area are literally having the life sucked out of them over the last 15 years, as the wealth that left New York for 20 or 30 years is now going back, and it's a phenomenon that people need to actually address with capital and uh, and the kind of things we're doing. You're bullish. I'm totally bullish about it, and uh, I'm probably more impatient than people that <laughs> we both know in, in Newark. And, yeah. uh, you know, we still are looking for more investors, and people should, you know, be aware there's a lot of ways to help this cause. But it's very clear that if you create a tech job, five service-level economy jobs are created, and then we need jobs and we need taxable revenue in Newark. Don Katz, so we appreciate everything you do. We need more leaders like you to build cities like Newark. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by United Airlines, Investors Bank, Holy Name Medical Center, Health Republic Insurance of New Jersey, Fedway Associates, Partners for Health Foundation, and by ADP. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. My name is Dr. John Rundback. I'm actually the medical director of the Interventional Institute here at Holy Name Medical Center. The peripheral arterial disease actually is extremely common. It's one of the forms of hardening of the artery. As interventional radiologists, we perform minimally invasive image guided procedures. Generally, the procedures we do are alternatives to what would otherwise be major surgery. Almost 80% of those patients can avoid amputation if they're referred for us for these sort of procedures. Holy Name Medical Center in Teaneck, New Jersey, 1877 Holy Name. Healing begins here.